Thank you for attending our Utilities and Services Deep Dive Meeting for the Electoral Area EOCP uh, Community Advisory Group. This is our fourth of five meetings, so I think we're getting the hang of it here. Uh, tonight is another very presentation-dense night. We have a lot of uh, great guests in the room with us, so I ask once again that uh, you respect their time and keep your questions succinct. I will be sending around questions afterwards again to the presenters if there's anything that was missed. So those uh, question and answer sheets will capture uh, questions that we ask verbally during the meeting, uh, that end up in the comments box during the meeting, and then anything that is emailed me to me afterwards uh, that you think of. Uh, and all of those question and answer sheets will be ready for our May 12th meeting. So uh, that is for the community advisory group, your meeting to debrief the first four deep dives. And Stephanie will be chairing that in the fire hall once again in person. Um, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're gathered here tonight on the lands of the Seelks people. Uh, and I believe that's all from me, so I will stop talking at you and let the presentations begin. Uh, our first panel is on public works, and we're opening with Chris Garish, the manager of planning here at the RDOS, and I will share his video with you. Sorry. I had it all open ahead of time and now it's mad at me. One moment. Good. Here we go. Tonight, in relation to a project that we completed last year on street lighting policies and regulations within the RDOS electoral area of official community plans. <laughs> so before I start uh, with the meat of the presentation, I just wanted to get some context slides out of the way. So um, I believe there's some references later on to ornamental versus overhead street lights. So for everybody's benefit, ornamentals are the ones shown up left here on the screen. Um, they tend to be ones that are unique, uh, uh, usually purchased or acquired by developers as part of their development and, um, uh, you know, come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, the second type, the overhead street light, are the cobra heads. And I believe these are the standard uh, options that uh, Fortis uses within uh, the electoral areas, particularly on street poles, which of course is different than ornamentals. Ornamentals tend to be, or tend to be standalone, uh, whereas the cobra heads are always on shared utility uh, poles. Uh, another bit of context too is um, just because this, I know this is the area EOCP review, um, there is an apparently extensive street lighting service area within Aramata. I apologize for the colors on my map, uh, but it's the best I could do. Um, and hopefully you can see it all, but it's the yellow shaded area uh, uh, on the map at left, which is almost the entirety of the uh, settled Aramata area, including ALR lands. Now, uh, despite the service area being so extensive, the actual physical footprints of the street lights, as far as I'm aware, is significantly less. And so what we're looking at here is obviously the disconnect between the footprint of the street lights and those who contribute to the upkeep of the service. And there's always an argument that the benefiting residents from the street light service are more than those who just happen to have a street light on their property or in front of their property. And again, just another example in this one from the um, uh, village core. Uh, another cobra head on a shared utility pole. And uh, it's my understanding again too, with most of the streetlights in Miramata, they are in the village area, uh, but they also do occur on certain intersections as well, which I'll touch on in a bit. So when we undertook the streetlight review in 2021, uh, we were dealing with an issue with our board uh, policies and bylaws. So um, almost universally, our electoral area OCPs were silent on street lighting issues. Uh, there were also no, no board policies, uh, separate board policies that spoke to street lighting. And uh, the service establishment bylaws that allowed for the creation of the street light service areas, uh, you know, obviously they're not policy documents, uh, they're more regulatory, but and so accordingly, they didn't really provide much direction either. Uh, so as a result, uh, with basically the last bylaw standing, which was the subdivision servicing bylaw, 
uh, which again is kind of a regulatory document, but it was in a directly setting priorities for streetlights, for, which was presenting some challenges. Um, now, before I get into those challenges, I'll just give some more background context. Uh, so everything we do in land use planning is generally governed under the Local Government Act. And uh, it's this piece of legislation that allows for the regional district to adopt various bylaws, such as OCPs, zoning bylaws, and subdivision servicing bylaws. And in adopting a subdivision servicing bylaw, a regional district can uh, take into consideration a number of design elements, whether it's for sidewalks, boulevards, crossings, uh, transit bays, underground wiring, and importantly, street lighting. So street lighting is something that we do have authority to regulate. Um, the regional district's history with regulating streetlights um, is fairly recent. Uh, the first subdivision bylaw was adopted by the board in 1970, so 52 years ago now. And in that time, there's been six different iterations of the bylaw. However, uh, street lighting didn't show up until 1995 when a new uh, subdivision servicing bylaw was adopted. Uh, and that particular bylaw appears to have been based on a municipal template, hence the regulations that we received at that time in relation to streetlights. Now, just because the legislative authority exists to regulate streetlights through subdivision servicing, it does raise a question that in the absence of every, any other bylaw or policy dealing with it, should subdivision servicing bylaw be the way to prioritize street lighting in the regional district? Um, now, we undertook a review of other RDs to see how they dealt with it. And uh, one of the findings that we found interesting was that very few of them actually dealt with it through their subdivision servicing bylaw. We were the exception. And again, as I indicated on in the last slide, I think that was generally a result of the uh, RD inheriting a, a municipal template in 1995. So what does the subdivision servicing bylaw do or what did it do? Because of course this project is now complete. So at the time it um, basically established, and this is the key point, uh, that any new subdivision that created a parcel uh, less than 0.25 of a hectare or theoretically, if there is, you know, a, a building permit was being contemplated for an apartment building or a townhouse, um, then the street lighting would have to be provided. And then the bylaw went on to proceed to tell what those design criteria were in terms of minimum levels of illumination, uh, the location of poles and underground ducting, i.e. how far apart do they have to be, the materials to be used in the poles and how they're supposed to be installed. So as I've been kind of hinting at, this was leading to some uh, sub-optimal outcomes. And I've got a couple of examples here, actually both from Naramata. Uh, and so here we have uh, a proposed subdivision of a parcel on Mill Road, uh, which was creating parcels less than the 0.25 of a hectare. So the subdivision servicing bylaw said that this subdivision had to put in a street light. Uh, you know, the, the property owner wasn't really keen on that. And one of the points they made to us and asking for that requirement to be waived through a development variance permit is that the next closest street light was approximately 650 meters uh, from their particular property. Uh, so putting a street light there wouldn't actually be an extension of an existing um, lit up area. And they were actually concerned that it might detract from the area by introducing this light. So they applied to the board for the variance, the variance was granted and they didn't have to put up a street light. The second example is up on uh, the Benchlands development. And uh, again, because of the size of the parcels that were being created, the subdivision servicing bylaw was requiring a, um, I think it was around, I can't recall, 10 to 12 streetlights potentially being having to install at this, uh, at this particular subdivision. So the developer wasn't really keen on that. Um, they felt it would result in a level of illumination that was kind of uncharacteristic of the area and also not something that they want to have in their uh, subdivision. So again, they applied to the board to have that requirement, not, not entirely waived, but to be reduced from the 10 or 12 lights down to, I believe, five in total, which are shown here with the yellow text. And so that was approved as well. And again, I can't recall, but uh, I know there is some street lighting up on the Benchlands area, but again, it's, um, it's a question of how much is appropriate for a, a rural area. So you can see the two issues that are being kind of raised here, um, the existing network itself and then the fact that you're in a rural area and how much lighting is appropriate. So that, that's basically the issue that we identified at the staff level was that um, you know the, the requirements of the subdivision servicing bylaw as the only bylaw setting policy for the installation of streetlights may have been working across purposes uh, to what a lot of our electoral area OCPs seek to preserve and protect in terms of the rural character of the electoral areas. And so if, if you accept that electoral areas are generally rural, 
um, that there's not going to be as much street lighting and that dark skies are important, then you don't want a, by a separate bylaw uh, that's running across purposes to that. So uh, we put some recommendations to the regional district board. And I think the most important one for the review committee is that um, the, the big one was to introduce actual objectives and policies into all of the electoral area OCPs, not just Naramata, but all of them, uh, to give a better guidance to staff, developers, the public, as to where street lights would have to be installed going forward. And um, in conjunction with that, it was also proposed to remove almost all of the regulations from the subdivision servicing bylaw. And a large part of that is because um, we don't actually own the infrastructure. Uh, it all belongs to Fortis. Fortis has their own products list that they use. And we didn't feel it was appropriate for us to be telling Fortis to do something else other than what Fortis normally does. So uh, we were just going to vacate the field to Fortis. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, having worked through the OCP, um, Aramata, there's always objectives and those objectives are supported by policies. So in relation to street lighting, uh, the, the main objective that was introduced was basically to discourage the creation of street lighting uh, service areas in the electoral areas unless there happened to be an RGS growth area uh, designation over a location. And so the, the point here largely being to try to preserve dark skies uh, in the electoral areas. So in terms of supporting policies for this, um, we tried to introduce a, like a kind of a ranking of where we would consider uh, new street lights in terms of um, uh, priority. And uh, I don't think there's anything too surprising here. Um, if, if a request comes in from a property owner and they say they want street lights, well, the first things we're going to look at are A, are you, is your property at an intersection? Is this a high volume intersection? Does it, would it benefit from a street light? Are you close to a school or a park? Um, would putting a street light there be a beneficial, a benefit to the community for that purpose? Um, sometimes you'll see the lights installed by the community mailboxes and that's to help with visibility and access. Uh, same with transit stops. Is there a proposed bus stop or an existing bus stop nearby that would benefit from the light? And also, again, this last one ties back to the regional growth strategy. Is the property within a designated town or village center zone? Which are usually what we apply to our rural and primary growth areas. In which case, then yes, there's probably mixed uses, businesses, commercial, et cetera, uh, that may benefit from a street light. So those are the priorities. If you're not in one of those priority areas and you're asking for a street light, you may find you, you may find that staff don't support your request. Um, other policies that we put in, um, again, just for environmental uh, considerations, uh, encouraging the conversion of the existing um, bulbs to the uh, high efficiency uh, LED fixtures. And um, the, the picture shown here is an international example, but I found it useful just to show how the LEDs, which are on the left, uh, compared to the older type lights, which hadn't been replaced yet in this particular location and are on the right. Uh, as I mentioned, um, there were changes made to the subdivision servicing bylaw, basically stripped it right down to some bare essentials. So most of the regulations were taken out because basically we see this as being for this is domain. Uh, we did have some priorities that we did want to keep in though, and that those generally relate to uh, prohibition. So um, there is a, a retained prohibition on high pressure sodium lights and um, also trying to discourage the introduction of ornamental street lights. Uh, that haven't been pre-approved by the regional district. And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, ornamentals can be finicky, hard to maintain, hard to find replacement parts for, and depending on how many you have, replacement costs can be significantly more uh, because it's possible that the model has ceased to exist or it's custom made and you have to do a special order. And again, depending on the number of ornamentals you're trying to maintain within your area, um, you could be looking at significant uh, training costs to staff as well as um, you know, just the cost of maintaining inventory for a wide variety of lights. So the, the, the more you can constrain or limit uh, the use of ornamental street lights to a few select models, it's probably the better. So uh, we put in a policy or sorry, a regulation in so subdivision servicing bylaw saying that really ornamentals should be drawn only from the list pre-authorized by the regional district. And that's it. Uh, and unfortunately, because this is a recording, I can't take any questions, but um, uh, Sure, if you have some and Danielle's unable to answer, we can take uh, take notes and try to get back to you. And thank you for your time. Okay. So uh, Chris is not 
here. So that was a recording. We're going to do the same style as we did in our previous meetings, uh, where it's a panel. We move through all the presentations and then do questions at the end. So I will we'll move along to Andrew Reeder, our manager of operations here at the RDOS. Go ahead and share and unmute, Andrew. Okay. okay, can everybody see uh, the presentation there? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so um, I've been asked to talk about the solid waste infrastructure with the regional district, uh, specifically to talk a little bit about um, uh, the new food composting system that we're proposing. Uh, also wanted to talk about how does the current system work, uh, some of the infrastructure issues that we're currently experiencing, and then some policies uh, for the group's consideration that may flow from that. So along with, um, just starting off with the landfill itself, so uh, the Area E is part of the uh, Camel Mountain service area. It's also serviced by Okanagan Falls landfill as well. And the Camel Mountain is called a sanitary landfill and services uh, B, D, C, F, G, and I, as well as E. And the um, Okanagan Falls landfill is a demolition and construction waste landfill. And that one uh, is one where we actually take the demolition waste and sort those and then recycle the vast majority of materials. Uh, and that is recovered through the feeds are recovered through tipping fees. And then the second part to our system is really um, a curbside system where we actually uh, pick up the refuse, recycling, yard waste, and uh, large items. And those are all contracted out to waste connections. We also have a depot at the Camel Mountain Landfill that's part of Recycle BC. Um, the RDS itself does not provide service for commercial or for multifamily uh, strata complexes, so apartment buildings, uh, duplexes, uh, things of that like. We don't actually provide service, and the reason for that is that um, we find that those services are there's special needs. So there's groups that need pick up uh, on a more frequent basis than what we provide. And they have different types of needs as well. So grocery stores might need uh, more cardboard pickup than say, for example, that you might see at a, at a home. Curbside itself is mandatory for residential use. And we found that that was a much cheaper solution than actually looking at depots. So that was the reason why uh, we have a curbside service. Camel Mountain uh, itself uh, recovers again, it's cost through the tipping fees. So the proposed food waste composting um, is what we're looking at doing is creating a system um, actually just above the landfill. And the idea here is that we'll be creating a processing center and this would be combined with the city of Penticton's uh, biosolids processing uh, facility that is at the landfill. And the benefits would increase uh, the actual diversion and life of the landfill. So currently we have about 40% of the waste stream is actually estimated to be organic. And we feel that we can roughly divert 26% of the total waste stream by having a curbside program. And what this converts to is basically 14% uh, reduction in total uh, is what at least the city of Pedecton feels we could reduce our GHGs by. So it has a significant um, uh, environmental impact it creates a valuable topsoil. So the soil um, itself actually conserves water uh, because it's a bit of a spongy material. It doesn't allow um, materials to leach directly into the groundwater. Uh, so it's a lot better um, of a solution than when you look at uh, chemical fertilizers. Provides an alternative to burning and uh, it allows a more efficient use of farmland by moving the materials to the landfill and a commercial composting. Uh, it reduces the total footprint needed uh, for the farmers to, to manage these ways. So that's a benefit to them as well. The proposed uh, facility that we're looking at building at 1313 Greyback will actually have an odor control system and reduce the current uh, odor levels. So we're looking at reducing odor levels by 70%. It'll create economies of scale by combining biosolids, yard waste, and food composting. So using some of the materials, 
we'll be having uh, two different streams of compost created, uh, but we can actually use some of the same uh, infrastructure. So there's a savings there. And then it eliminates uh, leachate by uh, creating an impermeable surfaces. And I'll just give you a sort of a, a brief video overview and it may help a little bit. Andrew, we're not hearing it on our side, but I, I did pull it up over here just in case that happened. Ah, perfect. Well, why don't you why, why don't you hit play on your side and see if it works? <laughs> okay, let's see if I can pull this off. I'll stop sharing. Hold on. Okay. Here we go. This is an overview of the proposed organics composting facility at the Campbell Mountain Landfill in Penticton. You can find additional information and provide feedback by visiting the RDOS Regional Connections Community Engagement website or calling the RDOS directly. The proposed composting operation would be located east of the Campbell Mountain Landfill on land currently within the Agricultural Land Reserve, the ALR. The new operation would be designed to accommodate up to 35,000 tons of organic materials per year. The RDOS Solid Waste Management Plan identified composting as one of the best means to divert waste entering local landfills. Food waste and other organic materials account for approximately 40% of waste entering landfills in the regional district by weight. The RDOS has applied for a grant that would fund food waste diversion and the proposed organics composting facility. Well, this project is long overdue. The Board of Directors has been working on this along with staff for many years now. and. In the past, the Board of Directors has said the best place to site a composting facility would be as close to the current landfill as possible. And really, we need to tackle the issues around leachate because, we, you know, that is not environmentally friendly. So it's really important that we deal with our leachate. We reduce the odor, which will have a, a really important impact for the residents in the area. The City of Penticton has committed to building a new wastewater solids composting site at the Campbell Mountain Landfill on land the City already owns. Feedback gathered by the City of Penticton in a citizen survey indicated strong interest from local residents for the establishment of an organics composting facility. By working together, the City of Penticton and the RDOS believe a better solution is available. We're looking at a means of adding uh, yard waste and food waste to create a larger facility that would improve the economies of scale. This would reduce our operational costs as well as our capital costs, as well as allowing us to access federal and provincial grants that we couldn't otherwise. In communities in Canada, a lot of them already collect yard waste. So collecting food waste and yard waste together is not a new collection system, so it's relatively easy to adopt. I think some of the big advantages is you're diverting food waste from the landfill, so you're basically throwing less material in the landfill, which means that your landfill is going to last longer. Trying to find new landfills is getting harder and harder all the time. So really trying to do what you can to preserve that capacity is a very important part for any community. The province of BC strictly forbids composting sites from polluting groundwater. Composting facilities are required to have liners and impermeable surfaces to trap any possible leachate. Liquids would be recirculated on site, which reduces water consumption. All composting would take place inside a building, which allows for strict odor controls. This could potentially reduce odors in the area by as much as 70%. We've done some tests with this type of system, and we found that uh, by having the Vortex cover over top, we can contain the odor under the cover. So that's a huge step in terms of trying to minimize uh, odor impacts on the community. Having it inside the building, we have that secondary level of containment so that any odors that comes up above the, 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 the cover is collected again and treated in a biofilter before it's released in the environment. So it will achieve a much higher level of odor containment by having that secondary level. If we're looking at uh, improving efficiencies as an organization, we want to uh, look at the best means and method of doing uh, just that. And it's important from an environmental perspective because we want to reduce our carbon footprint. The proposed facility would compost yard and food waste in a different composting stream from wastewater solids compost. This process creates an important soil additive that will meet organic food standards. 
In addition, the proposed facility would create a critical means for farmers to dispose of their trees, prunings, and food waste. Other methods such as burning cause air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and are restricted during burning bans. The new facility is expected to help reduce wait times at the landfill. Vehicles with yard waste would go to the composting site and not to the landfill entrance. This would reduce lineups at the landfill scale. Alternatively, the facility could be sited on the existing Campbell Mountain landfill property with a portion on ALR land. This presents options that are still viable, but more costly to develop. It's really important for the board of directors to hear what our citizens are concerned about and make sure that they understand that their concerns are being dealt with. And we wanna make sure that the siting of a new composting facility is clearly in the best interest of everyone in the region. The RDOS values your input. Please visit rdosregionalconnections.ca to provide feedback or ask questions. You can also call the RDOS Solid Waste Department. Thank you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> carry on from here. So some of the issues that we're having right now, um, I guess, I don't know if anybody's experienced this over Christmas, but um, uh, basically from December 9th to January 20th, we had quite a few missed services uh, that occurred. And we're seeing that we're having problems with um, a number of new subdivisions that are being built where um, there's problems with the turnarounds that are being provided and there's also problems with some of the road grades and some of these are causing issues in terms of service that we're having um, that we're able to provide to uh, residents uh, some of the issues i guess what we're, we'd be recommending in terms of um, ensuring service to our residents uh, and again, this is a mandatory service, is that we would have a 12.8 meter radius and uh, grades that are 10% or less. We're also having issues uh, that we're experiencing in terms of uh, commercial storage and uh, pickup of refuse and recycling for commercial and medium uh, to high density stratas. So what's happening here is that unless there is a storage area built at the time when that commercial store is uh, constructed, then we have, uh, if there is no storage areas, then we, we have problems where um, the commercial um, entities have problems managing their waste, and that can cause problems uh, for um, everyone, really, because that could end up on the curb, it could end up in all kinds of different places, or it could just be a major problem for the management of those materials. Uh, case in point is Apex, um, where the um, uh, the actual all the commercial entities uh, within Apex actually have to ship by hand all of the uh, their garbage and recycling to the local transfer station, which is um, uh, you know over 600 meters away, and so that becomes that becomes a problem. Uh, we also think that uh, we need this at zoning or at some other land controls in order to manage these. So this would be uh, because we don't have this at zoning or sorry, at subdivision that we need this uh, kind of control at, uh, at the zoning. So with that, what we are encouraging uh, overall is that uh, we encourage the development of a curbside food collection system for the reasons that we've shown. Uh, we're recommending that we undertake land use rever reviews um, that ensure that there's adequate space for commercial refuse and recycling storage for commercial and medium high density stratas. And then we also um, want to ensure that we, when we undertake land use reviews that we ensure that laneways and roadways can be serviced by refuse and recycling service trucks. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to move along in our panel and then open up the questions at the end. So next up, we have Shelly Fiorito. She is one of the projects coordinators at the RDOS here. I'll just pull up her presentation and give her this computer. Hi, everybody. Um, so, uh, as Danielle said, my name is Shelley Fiorito. I am the Wild Safe BC coordinator for the RDOS, as well as a project coordinator for the RDOS. Um, so, uh, just a really quick, uh, brief few slides just to explain uh, the Wild Safe program and the Bear Smart designation that the community of Naramata um, has currently. So, a lot of people um, kind of associate the Wild Safe program with Bearware, which was the the early um, iteration of the programming, and it switched over in 2013 to Wild Safe BC. Um, and the purpose of that was just to expand from only the bear species specifically to uh, tie in the rest of the wildlife species that are creating issues in communities across the province. Um, Wild Safe BC is a, um, an education program uh, with the purpose of reducing human wildlife conflict. Um, and there's actually over 30 coordinators across the province that provide this service. Um, school group presentations, farmers markets and com community events are part of the education process that we participate in. Um, as far as Naramata is concerned, um, Naramata received uh, the Bear Smart certification in 2014 um, and then successfully renewed that programming in 2019 um, so that runs until uh, 2023 or 2024, I guess. Um, and it's one of only 10 communities in the province that's achieved this status so far. Um, and the idea is to uh, generate a whole community plan or action plan um, to reduce conflict in the community. Uh, some of the uh, steps required, uh, a bear hazard assessment report is completed. Um, any of the issues that were brought forward with this assessment process are uh, addressed in the Bear Human Conflict Management Plan. Um, some planning and uh, decision-making documents are created. Um, so that would include uh, steps going into the OCP and the Solid Waste Management Plan, um, implementing the Continuing Education Program, um, addressing waste management systems and then creating the bylaws and compliance strategies, uh, which we have here that bylaw number 2819 um, currently exists. Um, so, uh, because Naramata went through the initial assessment process in 2014 uh, to go through the renewal, renewal process, um, you're just kind of reviewing uh, the existing infrastructure that that was created initially and addressing any uh, shortcomings in the process itself and, and deciding whether uh, any of the plan needs to be updated based on changes in the community or changes in hazards. Um, and then just identifying new short and long-term goals for the program. And then finally, I guess the, the general objectives of the Bear Smart status are to reduce the human bear conflicts in the community to increase public safety and reduce the number of bears that are destroyed due to food conditioning and habituation. Um, in this community of Naramata, uh, because, I mean, I guess in all of Okanagan, there's been such a huge turnover of, of uh, properties and ownership. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that we need to address with the Bear Smart status is just making sure that new residents are aware of uh, what the bear smart status means how much work goes into it and, and the maintenance of it. Um, and it is quite a unique um, certification for the, for the community to have. So it's a, a cherished um, indication, I think, for the, for the community itself. And all the heavy lifting has already been done because we have um, created some of the, the steps with the certification process that will go into the OCP planning. So it's uh, easy just to write it straight into the plans. And that is all I have uh, to offer, just some uh, contact information, and, and I'll be here for questions as well afterwards. Good. Thank you, Shelley. Very quick. I love it. 
Uh, up next, we have Stephen Juke. Some of you have heard from him before on our Water and Sewer Day. I know not everyone is at every presentation. Um, he's just going to touch on a couple of the uh, utilities pieces we're missing here for uh, electrical, gas, and anything else. Thanks. Go ahead. And I don't have a presentation, so um, I don't know if... Yeah, here, here I am. Um, I don't have a presentation, but I will speak a little bit on um, other services that are provided uh, for development, basically, uh, electrical, gas, and uh, communication services. One of the um, interesting things is that uh, these services are not actually covered by the Local Government Act, as it was mentioned in Chris's presentation. Um, uh, Section 506 of the of the Local Government Act doesn't specifically lay out any um, uh, requirements that, that we can place on um, these services, except uh, one is underground wiring. And that's typically associated when we want to see uh, streetlights placed in the, um, in the area. And that's typically both street lighting and uh, underground wiring is typically for a uh, small lot or higher density um, developments. Um, that's the levels of service that we, we see in our bylaw. Um, so the, how, how these services get put in, um, they, and I don't want to steal anyone's thunder from MOT, but uh, they have um, a relationship with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, uh, and they have uh, blanket access um, to the road structure or, or the road right-of-ways and they construct their um, infrastructure and services in the road dedications. And typically the RUS doesn't have too much um, interactions with it besides um, if there's any conflicts or if there's some mutual benefit to, to sharing um, right-of-ways or, or, or things like that during, during construction time. Um, so yeah, that's really about it on uh, extra services. Excellent, thank you, thank Stephen. You. Wonderful, so we have some great guests we're very lucky to have now from the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure with us. Mitch Benke, who is a development officer for our area with uh, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, which I call MOTI, sometimes people call MOT, um, and Chris Keir, the area manager for roads. I'm not sure which one of you would like to present first. Um, I have Mitch, but if you wanted it to be Chris, up to you. Please go ahead and unmute and share. I can start first. Thanks, Mitch. Okay, can everyone hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, my name again is Mitch Banky. Oh, sorry. It would be great. It would be great to see you. <laughs> oh, great to see me. Hang on. Let's see here. I think I have to stop. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Uh, my name again is Mitch Benke, and uh, I'm a development officer with the Okanagan Shushwap District. Uh, and this is a brief overview of development services within the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. The ministry is divided into uh, three regions, the South Coast region, the Southern Interior region, which encompasses our area, and the Northern region. The regions are then divided into a total of 11 districts, ours being the Okanagan Shushwap district. The Southern Interior region uh, performs many functions ranging from planning, uh, project management, design, engineering, indigenous relations, uh, and admin and finance. There are also construction functions such as uh, field services, which includes the ministry's grading, uh, or formerly construction and paving divisions. 
Uh, the Okanagan Shushwap District performs more local functions, uh, operations, uh, oversees uh, the day-to-day -day operational aspects of the highway system. Uh, they administer district projects, and they also uh, administer the ministry's maintenance contract. Development services oversees uh, rural subdivisions, permitting, and other approvals. Uh, also included in the district is the, um, is the Commercial Vehicle Safety and Enforcement uh, Branch, CVSE. This, this outlines district staffing positions within our district office in Kelowna and our three area offices in Vernon, Salmon Arm and Penticton. For development services, the Okanagan Shushwap District has a provincial approving officer and two senior development officers, uh, one for Vernon, Salmon Arm and one for Kelowna, Penticton. Each office then has two development officers. Uh, development services functions in a support role to the provincial approving officer, but there's no direct reporting structure. So uh, development, uh, development officers don't report directly to uh, the uh, provincial approving officer. So what do we do? Uh, development services team ensures that development uh, occurring in and around the provincial highway system doesn't negatively impact road functionality, uh, public safety, or the integrity of its infrastructure. And this is managed through permits and approvals. In addition to this, the development services team reviews rural subdivisions that are outside of municipal boundaries uh, and makes recommendations to the provincial approving officer, who is the subdivision approving authority under the Land Title Act for rural subdivisions. To support uh, development services, we reach out to other members of our ministry team um, uh, who are experts in their fields, such as traffic and design engineers, geotechnical engineers, hydrologists, and also uh, our operations staff. Uh, we do this to gain knowledge. Uh, we need to provide a thorough review of our files. Uh, through this process, development services uh, staff becomes generalists in, uh, in various technical fields. Development services issues uh, many types of permits, uh, and they all fall into four categories. Uh, works on the right-of-way, access, special events, and structures. Works within um, highway right-of-way uh, include utility construction, exploratory surveys, bus stops, shelters and benches, roadworks, signs, mail and newsletter boxes, sidewalks and landscaping, cattle guards and gates, fencing, street lights, and traffic signals. Uh, highway access includes access to controlled access highway, commercial access, residential and agricultural access, and resource and industrial road access. Special events includes uh, races, triathlons that we have in the area, uh, cattle drives, not so much common in this area, uh, filming uh, and parades. Uh, structures uh, include uh, setback and encroachment. All structures uh, must be placed at least 4.5 meters back from the right-of-way, otherwise a permit is required. Each year, the ministry processes more than 6,000 permit applications for applicants to um, gain highway access, use or close a highway for a special event, or construct or maintain works, structures, uh, pipe or pole lines on or along a highway right-of-way. Each application has a thorough review process before a decision is made. Landowners and property developers can apply to the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure for approval to subdivide land outside a municipality. Provincial approving officers are statutory decision makers appointed to the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure by an order in council under the Land Title Act to assess rural uh, subdivision applications. And that goes again to what I said earlier that development officers like myself and my colleagues don't have a direct reporting uh, structure to a provincial approving officer. They work at an arm's length uh, to our group. 
The provincial approving officer uh, works alongside development officers to review each rural subdivision development application to make sure that all legislative and bylaw requirements associated with subdivisions are met. Uh, the plan uh, can be registered in the land title office and the new lots are created. Development services receives uh, an application for subdivision and evaluates it in accordance with various criteria, including but not limited to uh, road status, uh, safety of access, potential impacts of geotechnical hazards uh, and flooding on the proposed lots, uh, road land drainage, and ensuring overall public uh, interest is maintained. Development services also uh, is also involved um, in land use approvals, which include referrals from local governments, uh, such as municipalities and regional districts. Referrals are typically sent to the ministry because we have a legislated authority to approve the referral. Legislated referrals for land use approvals make reference to the controlled area, uh, which is pursuant to section 52 of the Transportation Act. The controlled area is the area within a radius of 800 meters from the intersection of a controlled access highway with any other highway or municipal street. This power ensures that local government rezonings within controlled areas do not affect the integrity of provincial highways in developed areas. The purpose is to ensure that the development authorized by the approval uh, or permit does not adversely affect the uh, present or future integrity of the controlled access highway. Section 48 of the Transportation Act is used to designate some highways as controlled access highways. These are usually numbered routes and are intended to carry higher volumes of interregional traffic. The intent of controlled access highways and controlled areas is to preserve a reasonable level of service to long trip vehicles on the major highway and street system and to enhance safety. The following are examples of referrals that require ministry approval uh, within the controlled area. Uh, there's zoning bylaws and text amendments, uh, development permits for the construction of commercial or industrial buildings that exceed 4,500 square meters, so quite large, um, amendments or cancellation of land use contracts and municipal road closure bylaws. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we can switch it right over to Chris here, who will speak about roads. Go ahead. Okay, um, I grabbed a PowerPoint that was set up for something else, so I've had to edit it a bit. And Mitch has already covered some of the stuff on it. So, um, I was worried there might be some overlap. <laughs> so basically, uh, the highways department, which the district is part of, has 1,100 staff and communities throughout the province, including three regional offices. 11 district offices, 19 community offices, 26 field construction offices, 31 way scales and inspection stations, and 420 marked vehicles. Uh, we're part of the Southern Interior Region. Uh, so the South Okanagan District is the teal color in the middle, which goes from the U.S. border all the way to Seymour Arm on Shuswap Lake. Our entire region has 400 staff and communities throughout the province, including the regional office in Kamloops, five districts, which are the Caribou, Okanagan Shuswap, Rocky Mountain, Thompson Nicola, and West Kootenai. Uh, the district. Okanagan Shoe Swap District has 47 members in communities throughout the Okanagan Shoe Swap in four district offices Kelowna, Penticton, Vernon, Salmon Arm, two CVSC inspection scales, Vernon and Caledon, and approximately 10,000 kilometers of roads. Uh, 
1,050 kilometers of numbered highways and approximately 300 bridges and structures. Uh, what we do, maintain and operate highways. So uh, basically our function there is auditing and monitoring the maintenance contractor, which provides the maintenance services. Uh, facilitated land development, which is dealt with through the development services people. Commercial vehicle and safety and enforcement. Uh, emergency response is a big one, especially in the last few years. Highway expansion or upgrading and rehabilitation. Okay, this was Rockfall, the north of Summerland in 2019. Uh, just the repairs. Oh, I'm gonna go through all those things. Administer the maintenance contracts, uh, work closely with the public, municipalities, regional districts, and indigenous communities identify and prioritize rehabilitation and infrastructure improvement opportunities emergency response motor vehicle incidents landslides floodings and wildfires ensure public highways are repaired safely and efficiently uh, maintenance contracts each maintenance activity has an associated specification that the contractor must adhere to uh, the general specifications cover surface, which is potholes, grading, and sweeping, drainage, which is ditches and culverts, uh, winter maintenance is plowing and patrols, uh, roadside maintenance, mowing, litter, and rest areas. Missed on there. Uh, traffic signs, traffic management, structures or bridges and retaining walls, network incidents, emergency response and patrols. And uh, local area spec specifications are mostly in our area. It's lane, lane closure restrictions, uh, pretty much from Penticton North. Our team monitors and audits, audits based on these specifications. And the specifications are an end product spec, so they don't tell the contractor how to do something, just what's expected. Uh, maintenance activities and response times vary depending on classification of road. Uh, the road classifications are based on the average daily traffic, so uh, mostly side roads are going to be falling in the three to six range, and anything above that are usually major highways. Uh, this is an example of the specifications for our response times for asphalt pavement maintenance potholes. So construct temporary patches consistent with the profile and cross file of the adjacent surface as follows. Uh, I'll just show the first one as an example pothole and travel lane or shoulder of an inside curve on a class one and two highway is one day. And on a six and seven, which is majority of the side roads, it's up to 14 days. Uh, this is our maintenance contractor, AIM Roads, and I believe their emergency number still works. Uh, you can get a hold of them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, pretty much all the social media networks. Uh, the maintenance agreement can be found on no one's going to write that down, but basically it's available on the uh, Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure website, and it's, and it's available to the public. Uh, district safety and rehabilitation. We develop a multi-year rehab program, uh, working with a variety of staff and stakeholders to identify, prioritize, and deliver the district rehab program. Uh, maintenance and rehab programs cover side road, longitudinal pavement marking, transverse pavement marking, cattle guards, danger trees, minor betterments, and guardrail installation. Uh, emergency response and recovery. Um, again, something that's 
only been in recent years with all the flooding and the safety program, it's, uh, roadside barrier and other safety signs and things. And the community safety enhancement program, which is usually a safety program developed in concert with local government. Commercial vehicle and safety enforcement promote, promote safe and efficient movement of goods to support the economy, uh, protecting provincial infrastructure, fixed way scales, mobile patrols and road checks. Commercial and private vehicle inspection programs, audit private shops conducting mandatory inspections, uh, monitoring the passenger transportation industry, taxis and buses. Inspecting every school bus in the province annually, all buses supported by provincial funding, uh, transporting kids. Conducting driver and mechanical inspections to ensure road safety for all users, uh, mechanical inspection, cargo security, and driver hours of service. Check out this verbo. Uh, these are just the contacts for the district. Um, Jeff Wiseman is the local operations manager that looks after the south, uh, south part of service area 08, and he is in the Penticton office. Uh, Gail Keith is the district program manager. Uh, myself, Kylie, and Scott are the three area managers that look after our areas. Uh, Perry Therian is the CVSE manager, and Eric Lackmuth is our district transportation manager in Kelowna. And that's it. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Okay, that brings us to the end of our utilities. Okay, we got into services a bit there, uh, panel. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and raise your hand, enter in the chat, or uh, otherwise send my way. I... We'll be watching for your hands. Also, feel free to take your uh, camera or turn your cameras on so we can see you when you ask your questions. I see Stephanie's hand. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. I have a, a few questions, um, but I'll ask them one at a time, obviously. Um, with regards to the first presentation, street lights. Are solar center street lights um, utilized in our area? It's my understanding they have a higher initial investment, but a longer life cycle uh, with longer term benefits. And the reason I ask is because there are some areas where we might not wish to see a street light, but for security purposes and safety, they might be a benefit. Um, and sensor lights will be in keeping with this dark sky movement put forward by Sita Slope. That's my first question. Uh, Stephen, are you able to speak to censored lights? Um, it, it's somewhat challenging for, for censored lights because mainly street lighting is, is, a, is a function of safety, mostly. Um, mm -hmm. And part of, part of the, the challenge with that is when, when um, they're not on or they don't work or, or the sensors are out or, or something to that effect. Um, uh, People, people like to honestly find liability in in things. Um, so we haven't really looked at that function functionality yet. Um, certainly, it, it it might be an option. One one of the things that we have to consider is that Fortis does um, own and operate all the lights. <coughs> Excuse me, and we do have to coordinate with them. Um, and I was going to, to to kind of bring this up in the sense that. Uh, that they have standard LED light um, lights that they use and stuff. So we have to coordinate with them on to which ones uh, we want in uh, in our service areas. Um, but yeah, that's that's something that uh, definitely can be explored. And then as for the dark sky initiative um, that that Chiso is looking at, it is one of the models of. Fortis's lights can be aimed downward so it keeps the sky dark. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, one of the styles is similar to what um, the city of Penticton has, um, sort of a top hat 
um, as I kind of call it, uh, style of light. And the LEDs are, are directed straight, pretty much straight down. So um, whereas if, if you get sort of a dome type of uh, covering, it, it just radiates everywhere. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, you have another question? I do. It's on a, a different topic. Um, waste moving to um, MOT's presentation. Is that okay to go there? Yep. Okay. So I understand that um, the pr provincial approving officer has a fair amount to say about rural areas and developments. And it's that individual who approved in, in the final analysis you know, developments like Outlook and Kettle uh, Ridge. Um, when the PAO is looking at those developments, do they look at the recommendations of our official community plan? In other words, what influence does our OCP have on that person's decision-making process? That's the first part of that question. Mitch, did you want to tackle that or do you want me to? Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that Bill Sparks, the provincial approving officer, uh, couldn't attend, uh, today. And I, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to, I'm reluctant because he is, because he is the, uh, the subdivision approving authority. I'm, you know, I'm reluctant to you know, put words, put words in his mouth. Uh, but, um, I, I guess, I guess generally, uh, the provincial approving officer, when he's, uh, when a subdivision application comes in. Uh, he reviews uh, he reviews all all aspects of it, and that's you know that's recommendations from uh, myself and other development officers uh, when we do our preliminary report on on subdivision, and uh, that report is based on uh, largely on uh, on uh, on comments that we get from our referral agents. Uh, our our main referral agent is of course uh, the regional district. Uh, and the regional district uh, responds in its comments in their uh, uh, what they what they call their subdivision um, their uh, uh, subdivision geez, review report. Any, subdivision review part SRR. Thank you. I couldn't think of what SRR stood for. And in that, um, they outline uh, all aspects of their uh, of their servicing subdivision servicing bylaw, but also included is uh, a section where they outline uh, their comments regarding the OCP uh, and the um, and the zoning. Um, so of course the the approving officer he he does he does review all that he takes all that all that into uh, into consideration, and um, the uh, in the final analysis. Uh, when all uh, when all subdivision requirements as laid out by the approving officer are are satisfied, uh, he looks to the regional district uh, for uh, for that confirmation that the um, that the uh, the subdivision meets the uh, the zoning the zoning bylaws. So not so much the OCP, more emphasis on the uh, on the zoning, and the approving officer gets that in the form of a letter of compliance from the from the regional district. So. So that's kind of generally how uh, how he how he goes about considering it. I don't know if that goes to answer your specific question, but uh, certainly certainly there's more emphasis from from a subdivision approving uh, perspective on the um, on the on the zoning aspects uh, rather than the OCP. Not to not to uh, not to dismiss the OCP because that's where you get your development permits and and and, and that sort of stuff from. But it, it's all in, it's all in captured in the. Uh, in the letter of compliance that comes from the regional district, that uh, that tells him that the subdivision meets their uh, meets the meets their requirements as well. Yeah, and I, I can just want to I just want to be certain that this the OCP has some uh, meat, and we're not just kind of you know spinning our wheels here because the other aspect of uh, development that's going on in our particular region. That's concerning to our our group, which is the Naramata Infrastructure Development Society, is that roads that were typically used as just sort of access roads, like Smethurst and Gone up past the Mokojo, are were not suitable for supporting housing developments of of you know of the nature that we're seeing. So when you have a road that's twenty one percent grade, kind of winding its way up a mountainside. That's hardly a road that should be considered for access to Kettle Ridge and Outlook. And even given Arowana down the way, there's 
there's no way that those two roads can be considered as appropriate access or collector roads, if you will. So somehow we've got to address this, and I would hope in the OCP that we might be able to have some influence over these decisions in the future. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Stephanie. I can add to the, the first part of that question, which is that when we get a referral from the ministry, we, the planners at the RDOS, review it against all of our bylaws and produce the SRR, the subdivision review report that Mitch mentioned. Uh, and that includes a complete review of the OCP as well. So it, it does get built into the process, both at the beginning to say these are our requirements, and then at the end of the subdivision to say whether the uh, developer has met the requirements that we lay out. Um, I don't know, Mitch, if you also want to address the question of um, how the ministry looks at access roads to a potential subdivision. Well, you know, again, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for the really? recruiting officer, uh, but um, you know, yeah. under under Section seventy five uh, of the uh, of the Land Title Act, lands 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 being developed have to have uh, and, and quoting the legislation has to have reasonable uh, reasonable access. Now, it's it you know it's it's obvious that. What would what would be deemed reasonable access uh, probably means uh, a lot to a lot of different uh, a lot of different people, and um, and I can appreciate the fact that there you know that there are concerns there with um, with the level of development that that that's going on. The questions start to uh, you know start to arise uh, whether or not the existing the existing uh, road network can uh, can support that. Um, all I can all I can say is 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 uh, is certainly. Uh, rural rural development, uh, you know, and of course, you know, we're you know we're we're talking about lots of varying sizes, but um, you know, um, generally, residential development is the lowest uh, generator of of traffic volume of of uh, you know, say as opposed to commercial and uh, heavy industrial that that kind of stuff. So. Um, it's you know it, it's it's a tough it's it's a it's it's a tough issue but certainly um, certainly that's another aspect that the approving officer um, you know takes takes into consideration and uh, and, and that's under his legislative uh, requirement to to make sure that all that all access has uh, has has or all development has reasonable uh, reasonable access and uh, you know that that's that's probably about as far as I can go on it I'm I'm not sure if Chris has any. Uh, other comments, but okay, uh, I will move on to Richard. Just so you have a chance to answer your question or ask your question, please go ahead. Thanks, uh, Danielle. I've uh, got uh, uh, a question for the gentleman from Moti. Um, uh, if if either of you gentlemen have been around for a few years uh, in this district, you're probably aware of the Kettle Ridge development and the um, flooding incident uh, that happened a few years ago there. Um, and I uh, I was interested. Uh, I noted in uh, Mitch's uh, presentation that. One of the items, one of the issues that is supposed to be covered uh, in a development permit, uh, one, one of the things that's given a high emphasis is on water control uh, to avoid flooding and such. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, Kettle Ridge development was approved and then a, uh, a very serious flooding incident took place. So uh, my first question is uh, uh, what uh, lessons were, uh, if any, were learned from that process, and uh, how are those lessons being applied to uh, subsequent developments that uh, Moti is approving? Well, um, to start off, uh, I'm, of course, I'm familiar with the uh, with the development that you're that you're referring to. Uh, I was uh, not the development officer that uh, that administered that that file, uh, so uh, my involvement in it uh, 
was was very limited. Um, again, I can speak in I can speak in general terms. Uh, you referenced uh, you referenced that uh, that notation that was in my that is was in my presentation. And uh, when a uh, when a subdivision application uh, comes in, of course, depending on the the density of it and the size and the complexity of it, uh, typically the ministry uh, will require, or I shouldn't say the ministry, the provincial approving officer will require um, that the uh, that the developer, the proponent, uh, completes a stormwater management plan or some sort of you know a stormwater management plan and uh, and a drain and a drainage plan. Uh, that plan, uh, when we, when we receive it, is uh, is typically reviewed by uh, by our regional engineering group, and uh, and those uh, you know those uh, those comments are then forwarded to the uh, provincial approving officer, and when uh, when the uh, when the provincial approving officer uh, accepts a, a stormwater management plan uh, based on uh, based on the advice that uh, that we get from our regional. Uh, regional engineering group. Uh, then it's then it's up to the then it's up to the developer to to implement that uh, as they're uh, as they're developing you know as they're developing and constructing their constructing their their project. Um, uh, you know other other than that, uh, I I you know I can't I can't speak directly to the to the to the to the the cause and effect of the of the problems that uh, that happened. Uh, with uh, with 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 Kettle Kettle Ridge, uh, but that is you know that's that's generally the the ministry's approach. Uh, we take I mean we take uh, land drainage and road drainage uh, very seriously, and uh, and we make sure that uh, you know that uh, that it's addressed as part of the as part of the uh, the review the review process. What happens after that when it comes time to actually you know implementing in, implementing the plan during during construction? Well, I mean, I mean, you you know, you hope everything goes in accordance to to what was to what was done in the plan. You know, obviously, you know, there were some you know there was some there were some issues with the uh, with the with the uh, Kettle Ridge uh, Kettle Ridge development. And uh, but like I said, you know, generally, you know, of course, it's the goal of the ministry to you know, to avoid anything anything like that. Um, but that's general. That's generally the way we approach uh, land range uh, stormwater. You know, stormwater management, road drainage, that sort of thing. Uh, if I might add uh, to what you're saying, Mitch, um, I believe that there is a a report um, on the ministry website regarding an analysis of the specifics of the the Kettle Ridge um, development. Um, I can certainly see if I can look that up and and. Give it to the committee if it's still online, um, and uh, and hopefully that can answer some of your questions with that, Richard. Absolutely, I, I believe that I believe that report is uh, is still available, and that was um, that report was uh, was put on uh, on the ministry's website at the direction of our district manager at that time uh, in an effort in an effort for uh, transparency. And uh, you know, and, and community, you know, community informant. Thank you. I can also link that report out uh, to the group. I we're running a little bit over time here, but I have, I have two more questions that were sent to me. So uh, hopefully, we can move through them quickly so we can get to our final panel. Um, one is for Ministry of Transportation: Is there a long-term plan for the roads in Naramata? No. <laughs> I guess that's, the, that's the easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> and is there any talk of doing one or an outlook for doing one in the future? No, we, we don't have any um, comprehensive area plans anywhere in the district. All right. I don't, I don't know anywhere in the province that they do it. Um, mainly because our budget barely allow us to respond to immediate requirements, let alone start long-term planning. There was 
back in the, uh, now we're going way back, 80s, we did do major road network plans, but for whatever reason, we don't do that anymore. It was a planning function that the ministry took on, but they don't do any longer. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just mention as well, um, and again, I, I don't want to speak for the, the approving officer or something like that, but, but he does at times have the option to, to assess um, the roads for, for developments um, and request a, 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 a roads, a, a transportation assessment. Um, I think he's, he, he's done one uh, some time ago, I think for, for a development uh, in there, and a, as I recall. Uh, but yeah, um, so there, there are, you know, different situations when, when uh, an isolated plan can, can be conducted. But yeah, I, I, we don't generally have a network plan for mm -hmm. the electoral area. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the last one I believe was 92. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it is, I've heard concerns from several people that uh, they're wondering about access on Naramata Road being the only road if we continue doing more development and or in the case of an emergency. Uh, I have one final question, then we'll wrap up this panel. It is directed at Andrew. Um, has there been any discussion on increasing the recycling pickups and or reducing garbage pickups given uh, people moving towards being green? Short answer is yes. Um, so part of the review uh, that we're actually doing right now in concert with the city of Penticton is to look at different options, um, especially with um, the introduction of uh, compost or uh, food waste collection. Uh, one of the options is to reduce the amount of um, refuse uh, pickup and, and look at um, different options for recycling and, and for compost again and for food waste. So we're looking at all those different options right now. And then our intent is to review that with the um, uh, city council and also with our board of directors. And then our intent is then to go out to the public through our solid waste management planning process to see uh, what the public thinks. and. Um, the more services that we provide, obviously there's a, a larger cost. Um, there's a very minimal cost, if any, um, if we um, are able to work with our existing program. So that, that's the balance that we have to find there, is the balance between um, additional services and then, um, uh, you know, versus, um, working within our services there. So I, I, I hope that answers your question. I think it does. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, I'm going to wrap this panel so we can move on. Thank you very much to Chris and Mitch and Andrew and Shelley and Stephen for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, I may send them out to you. Uh, you're welcome to watch the rest of the meeting, but you're also free to go if you want to escape. <laughs> so have a great rest of the night. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> And with that, I'll move us over to the services panel. Uh, we have with us Dennis Smith, who is our Naramata Fire Chief, and Carrie Reese, who is our Fire Smart Coordinator here at the RDOS. Um, I don't know if you worked out who wants to speak first, but you may have the floor. I can go first here, Dennis. Um, just give everybody a quick overview of the FireSmart program and what's occurred in the last uh, the last year following up to where we are today. So FireSmart, as most people know, is about wildfire prevention in and around our communities. So the initiative of the uh, program itself is really based on education and doing assessments and events. And through assessments, education is provided for, for the homeowners and as well events uh, promoting the, the principles of FireSmart. So in with last year's program, we had a lot of initiatives uh, regarding cleanup in neighborhoods and on uh, people's properties, 
having to do with uh, chipping programs and debris removal. And that's something we're going to continue this year. We've uh, extended the funding for that as that was a, a pretty sought after uh, item of funding within these different communities. And we're up to 14 committees now at this point throughout the regional district. Uh, last year, there was only about, I guess, six or so. So there's been some renewed interest as well. So that's uh, good to see. It's definitely top of mind considering the fire season we had last year. Um, in regards to the funding that has occurred, um, it's been like nearly the same as last year. So 48,000 per electoral area. And we'll be working with the different committees and fire departments within uh, these different areas, helping to distribute the money evenly and, and see what we can get done. Um, some of the new changes that are happening as we speak are two new staff members that are coming online on Monday. And over this past weekend, the, along with uh, several hundred other firefighters, uh, descended upon the town of Penticton here and um, were part of the welfare mitigation specialist training. So that's a core part of the training, uh, something called the Home Partners Program that we're going to be administering. And you will see us in your neighborhood at some point engaging with the public and offering uh, Home Partners Program assessments. So what that is, is a detailed assessment regarding their specific property, what they can do to mitigate the wildfire risk and uh, some solutions to, you know, some of the problems that they may have on their property. Um, where you may also have seen us as just general events. Um, Penticton Home Show was a pretty good success. We had roughly uh, 20 people sign up for Home Partners Program assessments. So. It'll be a little bit of a road show where we get some of these different neighborhoods and, and, and talk to these homeowners and give them a bit of education and stuff as well. So that's just the basics in a nutshell. I won't uh, take up too much more time, but uh, I'll pass it on to Dennis if he has anything to add to that. <laughs> Dennis, would you be available? Yep, I'm here. Just uh, trying to push the right button here at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, here we go. Yeah, so who we are, um, we're the Naramata Volunteer Fire Department. We're members of the local community. We come from all walks of life. There are about 30 of us at the moment. Um, we're people who care about our neighbors um, and we're people who, wanted to learn how to drive a fire truck. <clears throat> what we do it, what we do is uh, we respond to fire emergencies, uh, structured fires are our, our main focus, um, but we also respond to uh, wildland interface fires. And some of our members were at the training this weekend in Penticton. Uh, we also do rescue work. So we'll do auto or vehicle rescue and we have a boat. So we'll do marine rescue as well. Um, the biggest uh, the biggest part of our business is medical emergencies, and we respond with the BC Ambulance for medical emergencies in our community, and uh, that's about eighty or eighty five percent of our uh, call volume is medical emergencies. <clears throat> we also do some public education, and we work with Carrie and the Fire Smart program, and there are other fire safety programs that we're involved with. Uh, for example, at the seniors group uh, or at the elementary school in our community. So a little bit of prevention work as well. Um, uh, and we train every week, uh, Tuesday nights. So tonight in the other room, there's a group of us uh, doing some training. Uh, we train to industry standards. Uh, we are considered a workplace by WorkSafe BC, so there are some regulations there, some laws there that we have to comply with. Um, but we also train to provincial standards and industry standards uh, in the things that we do so that we can accomplish them effectively and safely for our members. Our membership safety is our number one concern. Uh, when do we do this stuff? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Tuesday nights is our night for training uh, consistently through the year. We also train 
as I mentioned, through through some weekends or weekend days, and we've been doing some of that this spring. Uh, where do we do this? So for the most part, we work in a service area uh, in the Naramata community. So we collect taxes from ratepayers uh, within that service area, and that's what uh, provides our apparatus, our facilities, our training, uh, our payroll. Uh, even though we are volunteers, we are paid for our training and call responses. Um, we also respond outside of our community. We have mutual aid agreements with neighboring communities within the regional district. So Penticton, Summerland, Caledon are our closest neighbors. Um, but we also have an agreement with uh, Anarchist Mountain, um, Princeton. Um, and so uh, we have a formal agreement within the regional district fire, uh, fire departments and area to uh, go and help them when they need help. Uh, we will also deploy on provincial events. So for example, um, we were called to Lytton last year. Uh, we declined the invitation, but uh, we did get down to Osuyas uh, the year before we were in Christy Mountain. Um, so we'll go out on provincial deployment as well. Keeping in mind, our primary responsibility is here in Naramata, so we, we do that carefully. Um, yeah, so, and basically how we respond to those emergencies, all types of emergencies, is we try and figure out what the problem is exactly. We'll come up with some objectives to accomplish at those emergencies uh, based on priorities of life and then property and then the environment. And then once we have some objectives, we'll deploy the appropriate resources to try and accomplish those objectives. So kind of in a nutshell, that's um, the service provided there by the Naramata Volunteer Fire Department. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, we are going panel style, so I'll move on to the next presenter and uh, Dennis and Carrie will both be available at the end for questions. So up next we have Anne Ben. She is our emergency program coordinator here at the RDOS. Please go ahead and take over. Looks good. Oh, we can't hear you. Hold on, Anne, you might have the wrong microphone. I can't hear you. Should be an option under the orange bar at the top, maybe to switch speaker. Is that better? Yes, got you. Sometimes when I switch between screens, it likes to play with my microphone. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me today uh, to talk about personal preparedness um, during the emergency. Uh, like Danielle said, um, my name is Ann Ben. I'm the emergency program coordinator here at the RUS. Um, so there's three steps to preparedness. One is uh, knowing your hazards and then Next is uh, making the plan that works for you and then gathering some supplies. So um, just, sorry, just a little bit about the hazards within the area. We know that the top three hazards that we have within the regional district are um, floods, fires, and landslides, um, which I think have all uh, been part of the um, situation for Naramata at some point in the past. So, um, just those are the top three and those are the things that um, we encourage people to prepare for. Um, so common misconceptions around um, creating a plan. Um, most emergencies are short lived. Um, as we know, emergencies are actually lasting longer than what they did before. So um, typically we would say plan for um, 72 hours. We're actually suggesting plan for um, about a week. Um, I won't ever have to deal with an emergency where I live. Um, we are seeing um, more emergencies um, happening closer to our homes, um, which causes the evacuation of our areas. Um, there are a lot of emergencies that you just can't prepare for. A lot of emergencies actually, um, the preparation is very similar. Um, 
so the sorts of things that I always uh, suggest to people, um, who is your contact um, inside your community? Who is your contact outside of your community? And do you know where you would go if you had to evacuate from your home? Do you have a common place where you and your family would meet if you didn't have a cell service or a way to connect with each other um, by phone? So um, those things don't take a whole lot of time, um, but definitely super important um, when, we're ha when an emergency occurs. Um, preparing takes too much time. Well, the more you can prepare, the better, um, but you can just start with small, simple little things first. So step one, know your hazards. And the top three that we have again, floods, fires, and landslides. Um, so the top 10 in BC, um, you know, we talked about what we have here within the RDOS, but also consider um, there are other emergencies um, and hazards that we have, like, so agriculture, think about the disease outbreaks, um, changing crops um, for a lot of our agricultural producers um, have noticed a shift. And I mean, I know when I was a child, um, I came up and I used to pick a lot of fruit um, and then it shifted to different types of apples and then it's grapes. And then as we're now moving into other crops as well. So things change um, and then we evolve as well. Um, other things that can affect us, but not necessarily us directly is um, an earthquake, right? So you could be part of somebody else's emergency plan. Um, hazardous spills, these can happen anywhere within the province, um, but could happen um, just on any road that we have around us. Um, so the next step is making your plan. Um, and really this is just your playbook of how you and your household want to respond in a disaster. Um, and this knowing a few things helps to reduce a lot of anxiety and stress um, when an emergency occurs. Know how you're gonna communicate. So save a list of people that you can call, um, someone that you can contact that's far away as well as somebody that's nearby. Um, <clears throat> know where you can find information. Um, so here within the RDOS, we have an emergency page um, on our regular uh, web page, emergency.rdos.bc.ca. Um, that's where you can go and find all the latest information about any evacuation order or alert or anything that um, potentially is happening. Um, also, if you wanna tag us with your Facebook and your Twitter pages, because those ones will also, um, you'll get the information um, as it comes out. If you haven't done it already, please sign up for Voyant Alert and you will get the information via text, email, or phone call. Um, and then if you're in the emergency and you aren't getting the information that you need or you need more information, um, please don't hesitate to give us a call at 250-490-4225. Um, and that number is um, active Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, and then um, when the EOC is open. Um, and you can expect to call back within 24 to 48 hours um, in the emergency. Otherwise, just call us back. Um, save your, your health information. Um, care card numbers, family doctors, medications, medical equipment, and any other important information. But the other thing that we have now is a BC services card. And if you log in there, you can get your health gateway, which then actually tracks a lot of that information for yourself. Um, so some considerations around your home, um, consider your emergency exits, Ex consider how you're going to leave your neighborhood. Um, and then consider information for your utilities and landlords that you might not have with you if you were to leave your home. Um, and then understand and know who your utility providers are so that then um, you can contact them. Have a meeting place. So we already said one meeting place close to your home and another one outside of your community. Um, and then plan for any of your school age children. Do you know your school's emergencies policies? Do you have somebody that can come pick up your children and then save your school's contact information? Um, so during an emergency, do you have somebody else that can pick up your children um, if they were moved by bus outside of the community into say Penticton or further? Um, plan for your pets. We know that in the um, regional district, the, uh, the number of people that have pets is around two thirds of our population. Um, so have a pet plan and have an idea as to where you're gonna take your pets. Plan extra food for your dogs, cats, and whatever pet you have, and then save the most recent information about your pets um, in such a way that you can pull it up quickly. Um, if you know someone who can look after your pet, that's great, or know where you can stay where you can bring your pet with you.
So planning for special needs. Um, think about having a supply of, of your prescriptions um, and a manual uh, backup for any wheelchairs or any other devices that you need to move around with. Um, if you have, um, if your animal is a service animal, make sure that that's part of your plan as well. Um, things to also th consider is extra batteries for hearing aids and other sorts of devices like that. Um, if you uh, have hearing aids um, or uh, somebody struggles with verbal communication, make sure that you have a writing pad with you as well. So the next part is building your kit. Um, there's lots of kits that you can buy, but the best kits are the ones that you um, put together yourself because you know yourself best. Um, and it doesn't have to cost you a lot of money to put together these uh, kits. So your grab and go bag is just a smaller version of the emergency kit. Um, and it's what you can just grab or you, you could, if you had to leave your home quickly. Anyways, if you want to learn more about how to get prepared, um, you can find out more information on preparedbc.ca and you can download um, any of the guides. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Anne. Okay, last panel item here. Uh, Mark Woods is unable to be with us, but if you do have any follow-up questions, we may ask him. He is the manager of community services here at the RDOS. Uh, but instead, we have special surprise guests, uh, Chelsea Mosey and Adriana McMullen from BC Transit. And your fun fact for the night, I worked at TransLink in the Lower Mainland for five years, and Adriana and I used to work together in that capacity. So we've just reconnected. Um, I will hand it over to Adriana and Chelsea. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay, perfect. So I'm just going to share uh, a presentation that we have prepared uh, for you. Pardon me, excuse me here. There it is. Are you able to see a screen? Hello? Not yet, but it it may be loading. There's a, a there might be one more click. There's a second share button in WebEx. There's a second share button. Okay, let me try that again then. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm just gonna stop this here and try once more. There it is. Okay, now we have it. Yes. Now you can see it. Okay, great. So um, welcome everyone and thank you so much for having us here. Um, so we are going to motor through a number of topics and we'll try and keep it punchy. Um, so who is BC Transit? We'll tell you about transit in the South Okanagan Simulk Mean, give you a little bit of insights around the system performance, um, give you some information about the expansions that have happened in 2022, and also give you uh, some information about your strategic transit plan, the Transit Future Action Plan. And with that, I am actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Chelsea, uh, who will um, give you an intro to who is BC Transit. Thanks, Adriana. Hi, everyone. My name is Chelsea Mossy. I'm Senior Manager of Government Relations with BC Transit for the Okanagan Region. Um, as Adriana said, thanks so much for having us this evening. So just to start off, a quick overview of who BC Transit is, what we do. BC Transit is the provincial authority that's responsible for, for providing transit service throughout the province of BC outside of Metro Vancouver, where, as it was just mentioned, transit is provided by TransLink. We operate 80 transit systems in more than 130 communities, and we work with 58 local government partners. So in the case of the South Okanagan Similkameen Transit System, we work with the Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen, with the Town of Princeton, with the District of Summerland, and with the City of Penticton. Next slide, Adriana. 
So this slide here just gives a snapshot of our partnership model with BC Transit in the center there. So on the one side of things, BC Transit works with the provincial government who's responsible for setting public policy objectives. BC Transit's in the middle there. We are responsible for operating a shared services organization. So back at BC Transit, Adriana and I are supported by a team of subject matter experts, um, ranging from our planning team that Adriana represents to scheduling, marketing, finance, and so forth. And then we hold an operating contract with our contracted operating companies. So in the case of the South Okanagan Steel Community Transit System for your area, that is Barry and Smith. And then we, of course, work with our 58 local government partners. So the Regional District of Okanagan, Similkameen in this case. And it is our local government partners that are responsible for setting the priorities for the transit systems, um, setting the routes and areas served, and ultimately setting the fare structure. Next slide. Uh, so this slide here shows our legislated funding formula for transit service. Um, this does come to us from the BC Transit Act. So for conventional fixed route transit service, the local government share of costs is 53.31%, while the province pays 46.69%. Uh, it is important to note that any revenues collected by the transit system, whether that is from passenger fares or from advertising revenues, go back to the local government partner. Next slide. And I'll turn it back over to Adriana for a few slides. Great, thank you, Chelsea. Um, so this section is a bit of an overview about transit in the South Okanagan, Similkameen. Uh, the transit service is contained in the One Rider's Guide. Um, this is um, a change from 2015 when I first started working in this area where you actually had four separate rider's guides. Um, the service is generally divided into two major categories. One of them are local routes, and these are services that function within communities. Um, BC Transit historically has been an urban city transit provider, so we operate the service in Victoria, um, in Prince George, in Kelowna. Uh, it's, a, it's a city bus uh, service that it began as. Um, however, the other type of service that exists in the South Okanagan to Milkmeen, in which we are seeing grow in a number of parts of the province, are services that operate at regional and interregional scales. These, in many cases, began life um, through uh, health connections agreements with the health authorities to enable access to medical services when there was some consolidation of medical services to larger centers. And so you can see here that there is a little purple line there for an matter that's circled in yellow. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Um, and the Naramata route that connects between Penticton and Naramata is considered one of these regional scale um, routes. Uh, if we look at the distribution of ridership and hours, you see two pie charts here. On the left hand side is the distribution of boardings, so ridership. Um, and this is across the different subsystems of the Okanagan Similkameen Transit Area or system. Uh, and so, as Chelsea mentioned, South Okanagan Similkameen is one of these. It's this orange slice of the pie here. Um, and then the yellower slice of the pie is Summerland. Uh, the green slice of the pie is Princeton. And then the large blue section is the Penticton uh, conventional ridership. And then if we flip over to the right hand side of the screen, you can see the distribution of hours. And so these are how many hours are provided annually by each subsystem. Um, I will mention that this data is from 2019-20. Uh, before the Okanagan connector, the South Okanagan connector was initiated. So the, the updated version of that would contain this. Um, by and large, though, the split in terms of ridership and hours um, is relatively proportional from year to year. There's not usually major shifts. Um, yeah, let's see here. There we go. Oh, did I? Can I go back one? Oh, oh dear, I think I'm... Okay, yes, over to Chelsea for the uh, 2021 um, uh, system. Uh, oops, oh dear, I apologize. System performance information. I, I do apologize. 
everyone else is misbehaving. Thanks, Adriana. So it does feel uh, to a degree like the 2020 2021 fiscal year was, uh, I, I, my apologies, BC Transit operates on a fiscal year. I know you operate on a calendar year, but uh, for our reporting purposes, we are operate on a fiscal year along with the province. Um, so the 2020-2021 fiscal year does seem like a while ago, um, but they are our most recent annual performance summaries that we have been able to share. We will soon be able to share our 21-22 annual performance summaries. Um, and these APS reports, as we call them, provide a snapshot of how the transit service has provided for this past fiscal year. And a lot of the things I'll talk to, uh, speak to here quickly for the 2020, 2021 fiscal year are very similar to what we saw in the 21, 22 fiscal year. So as you're all aware, the 2020, 2021 fiscal year was not a typical year with the pandemic taking hold in April, 2020. Throughout that year, BC Transit provided essential transit service to communities around BC in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And our services allowed students to travel to school, seniors to access healthcare services, and frontline workers to get to their jobs providing essential services. On board our buses, there were a number of measures implemented to provide protection to customers and employees, including new safety plans, provision of PPE, enhanced cleaning protocols, mandatory masks on board, and during the height of the pandemic, we moved to rear door boarding only for our full size bus for our full size buses uh, without fair collection. So as you'll see in the graphs in the next few slides, ridership dropped significantly at the start of the pandemic in April 2020. But by the end of the 2020-2021 fiscal year, and certainly into 21-22 and now into the 22-23 fiscal year, we're seeing very encouraging signs of recovery. And our number one priority continues to be to recover ridership. Safe restart funding was provided from both the province of BC and the government of Canada to cover lost fare box revenues as well as additional COVID-19 related expenses. And this funding was passed on to our local government partners via our annual operating agreements that we hold with them. Next slide. Oh, oops. There we go. There we go. So this slide here just shows exactly what I mentioned. It shows the ridership throughout the province of BC and the trends that we've been seeing. Um, so the blue line is pre-pandemic ridership, and then the orange line there is um, ridership since the beginning of 2020. And you can see that dramatic drop in April 2020 in ridership, where in some cases ridership dropped as drastically as 80% in some transit systems and has been slowly and steadily increasing since that time. Go ahead, next slide. So this slide here shows ridership for what we refer to as the Okanagan Similkameen Paratransit service. So that combines the Route 10, Naramata, Penticton, and the Routes 20 and 21 serving Okanagan Falls and Penticton. So here you'll see um, this only goes up until October 2021, so we can get you some more updated ridership information, but it is that slow and steady uh, increase that we see, uh, again, with some um, seasonal dips that we are used to seeing when it comes to transit. And then this slide here just quickly shows Penticton conventional ridership. Um, we do have automated um, passenger counters on board our buses, our full-size buses in the Penticton conventional transit system. Uh, so we do have some detailed ridership information from there. And this slide just shows that. And um, it does show that ridership increasing trend as well, just to show you um, the trend of ridership. Next slide. And next, just a few upcoming initiatives that we're excited about at BC Transit. Next slide. So to start with, next ride 2.0, uh, BC Transit's continuously aiming to enhance the customer experience and also to recover ridership. And as part of this, we'll be launching next ride, which is our automated vehicle location technology across the province on all fixed route buses over the course of the next year. And we're targeting rolling out next ride in your transit system in late May, early June of this year. So very soon. This technology will allow customers to see their bus in real time, and it will identify predicted arrival times for any stop 
On board the bus, automated stop announcements will call out stops to customers, which increases comfort and convenience, but also importantly, improves the overall accessibility of our transit service. Next ride will also enhance the operational data that we receive, which can be used to properly gauge system performance and effectively plan our transit systems. And then we'll, we're also excited to roll out electronic fare technology on board our buses next year. This new system will replace end of life technology and equipment and introduce contactless tap payment methods that will make it easier and quicker for riders to hop on board the bus. New payment methods will include mo a mobile app, debit card, credit card, mobile wallet, and a reloadable smart card, providing riders with the ability to pick the best payment method for their lifestyle and travel habits. While cash will continue to be accepted, the arrival of this system will mean less rooting around for change or heading to the store to pre-purchase tickets and passes. BC Trans has entered into an agreement with a company called Cubic, and the platform that we will be using for this technology is called Umo. If you recognize the name Cubic, it's probably because they're the longtime vendor for TransLink Compass Card Network that's used in Metro Vancouver. Currently, although dates are still subject to change, we're planning to roll out this technology in the South Okanagan Snow Community Transit System in June of 2023. Next slide, Adriana. And I think I turn it back over to you here. Yes, great. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, so this next portion of our presentation speaks to some of the expansions that we have been working on and implementing. Uh, so starting in uh, January, we had three major expansions. Uh, two of them were at regional district routes. So these are routes that are funded by the regional district of Okanagan, Similkameen. Uh, the big one was uh, the Route 70 Kelowna Penticton. This is the bus that connects Penticton and Kelowna to one another. Um, previously, there was four trips a day offered on Mondays and the rest of the weekdays only had two round trips. With this expansion, there are now four round trips per day offered between Penticton and Kelowna on all weekdays. Um, we created a brand new paratransit route serving the West Bench um, over on the other side of the valley from you, and that is called Route 11. It is an introductory service level, and they're starting off with three round trips per day on weekdays. And then in terms of the District of Summerland service, uh, they uh, implemented an expansion of the Route 30, where they now have an additional midday trip around lunchtime, noon, one-ish on weekdays, and then also the introduction of Saturday service, uh, which was something that they had been quite keen to see happen. Um, so we're pleased about those. And then moving on to uh, the last part of the presentation, which is the Transit Future Action Plan. Um, so the Transit Future Action Plan is a strategic plan. It's kind of like, the transit version of an OCP uh, or a regional growth strategy, it gives us that long-term idea of uh, where we're going. And so in 2015, we created one of these documents then called the Transit Future Plan. Um, and what it sets out are uh, ridership targets, what the transit network will look like, what the supporting infrastructure that's needed um, to make that all happen. So, you know, buses, garages, transit exchanges, and then using that information, it also provides um, estimates on the investments that are needed to make that reality happen. Um, and now every five or six years, we are reviewing these plans and updating them. And that plan review process is called the Transit Future Action Plan. Um, and then later, you know, another five or six years down the road after we complete this update, there will be another update of the plan. Um, so to give you an idea of uh, what kinds of initiatives you can expect to see in the plan. This is a snapshot of the 2015 plan and the priorities that emerged from the consultation that we did in the 2015 plan. We've checked off um, in boxes of the black check marks, the initiatives that have been implemented since 2015. And so in the blue box, you see the Penticton to Kelowna route. That route did not exist when we completed the 2015 plan and the uh, Okanagan Similkameen Regional District has been very, very committed with its partners to help build that route and create that service, bringing it up to four round trips uh, from, from nothing really. Um, well, there was one trip a day that went from the Soyuz up, uh, up to Kelowna on Mondays, but now it's a large bus, there's more space, 
Uh, there's more flexibility for you know people who are traveling for work purposes, for educational purposes, um, or for you know personal errands or you know social reasons, visits, family. Uh, and then uh, the other um, implementation that we've managed on the regional scale is uh, an increase of trips on the Soyuz to Penticton. They now have service on Fridays. And then uh, the Okanagan Falls route actually didn't exist when we began the plan, and that was one of the outcomes. And then this most recent introduction of service on Saturdays in Summerland was one of the priorities in the plan. So you can see there's still some outstanding priorities um, throughout the region. And so we will be working to reprioritize what does remain and identify things that um, people would like to see added to the list. On the local side, I'm going to click. There we go. Um, so on the local side, the plan also had priorities um, for the local services. And so you can see that um, within Penticton, um, introducing Sunday service on the Route 5 was a priority, and they've managed to do that. Um, the West Bench service, which it's Penticton area, uh, it was put in there, and that has now um, come to fruition. And of course, the, the Okanagan Fall service is there. So those are the kinds of initiatives that we would see in this plan and that we will be updating. Um, we've seen a lot of consistent interest with these initiatives that we had put together back in 2015. Um, so I don't expect that there will be too many changes, but uh, we will certainly be listening to what we hear from, um, from the community as we go through the process. And then lastly, oh yes, so this is um, some information about the engagement. So back in 2015, to create that 25 year long, long range strategic plan, we had um, 2000, over 2,500 people participate. Um, in 2021 for the, um, the update, we had um, a more modest participation. We were not aiming for the same quantity because it's, um, it's a more refined plan, it's more focused. Um, however, we will be coming out and doing some more um, uh, engagement using different methods, likely some mail out uh, methods um, to help have broader reach for the uh, uh, Transit Future Action Plan, just so we can make sure that more people have an opportunity to have their say in the plan. Um, yeah, and that more or less concludes our, our piece of the presentation. Um, I guess this is when we hand it back over to Danielle for questions. Oh, Danielle, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Adriana and Chelsea. Uh, we are just down to our last couple minutes here, so I'd like to squish in a couple questions. If you have them, please raise your hand uh, or send it in the chat to the whole group or to myself if, if you don't want to answer or ask publicly, rather. Uh, we have Dennis, our fire chief, Carrie, and, uh, and then Adriana and Chelsea standing by. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to say my closing bits for the meeting. And if you think of anything, go ahead. Um, but thank you to all of our presenters tonight. It's always a long night, but uh, so valuable to get all of these education pieces in. I really appreciate you taking the time from your evenings to do this. Um, and the same goes for our uh, group attending and participating. Uh, if there are any follow-up questions, I will be doing the question and answer sheets. All of the question and answer sheets will be ready for our May 12th meeting, which is a chance just for the group to debrief, um, and Stephanie will be hosting that. So it's a very much a group-led um, meeting. I see Nicole has her hand up. Please go ahead. Basically, it's about the fire and fire that's going on in British Columbia. I don't know if you guys are aware, but after tree planting, they tree plant um, evergreen so that they can harvest them a few years later. So what they do after the tree plant, they go and put glyphosate, which kill all the deciduous tree that are a natural barrier against fire. Um, 
So anyway, and then also uh, they also barrier against mudslide and everything because um, the evergreen burn like there's no tomorrow. But if you have deciduous enough, they do create uh, a mulch in the, in the ground. It's safe biodiversity. Anyway, I'm trying to say all this to say that uh, please look at the way that they do um, take care of our forests in BC uh, by looking at making some change that will probably help with the fire that we are seeing in the last few years. That's it. I don't need anybody to tell me anything. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> Noted. Anyway, I've got more detail on it if somebody want to talk to me. It looks, looks like Carrie has a response. Our, our fire Thank smart coordinator. It. Yeah, thanks for your uh, your comment there, Nicole. Um, that is something that is taken into consideration in uh, a lot of the reforestation that happens, and uh, they are definitely considering diversity. Unfortunately, in British Columbia, a lot of it, uh, the reforestation that does happen is based on monetary values and so on for items to be reharvested in the future. But I know definitely uh, where it doesn't boil down to dollars and cents, uh, the reforestation is definitely taken into consideration for the deciduous trees as well. So again, thanks for your comment and uh, hope you enjoyed the FireSmart presentation as well. Cheers. Thank you. Um, I don't want to run too much over time. Stephanie, did you have anything to add for uh, May 12th and anything you're looking for ahead of uh, leaving that one? Uh, no, I think uh, Peekable can just make sure they read those our FAQ sheets are going to be circulating. And um, just a reminder of the topic, we're going to be looking and discussing the deep dives. So, yeah, that's it. Looking forward to seeing everybody in person. Yes, I'm so excited. So, yes, in the fire hall, May 12th, um, it is 8.32, so I'm going to close this. I will send out, of course, follow-up email, and thank yous as always. Have a wonderful rest of your night.